First of all, thanks to Andrea and to Leandro Madrasa for inviting me to, give, to share some ideas, share some thoughts with people. Uh, first of all, I'm, as you can see from the title, I'm going to talk about drawing. But I'm not going to talk anything very, I'm not going to say anything very specific about drawing. I'm going to use a whole series of non chronological, very varied images, different types of architectural representation to discuss some of the ideas which, below, uh, which lie behind these drawings. But we'll come back to ideas about how we dwell. So, first of all, um, how do we represent dwelling? This is, I put up here two maps, because I think it's very important that we start off thinking of representation, thinking of drawings from the architect's perspective, as a way of creating a vision of one's environment, a vision of the world, or of a smaller space, of a home, whatever it may be. I've got two maps here. One is medieval from the 13th century on the left, and the other is by Buckminster to Fuller. And I think the interesting thing of comparing these two images, which are essentially of the same, of the planet as man knew it at that time. But they emphasize totally different things. You see the one on the, the, one on the right, we all understand the relative modern system, triangulating and flattening out a, a curved surface, a globe, into a flat image. The one on the left, however, is far more symbolic. Okay, we see Jerusalem as the dot at the center. There are certain real place names around the place. There are monsters, there are all sorts of things. But the idea is to establish the relationship between man and his environment, and his celestial environment as well. Now this, I think, is something which is crucial to the idea of dwelling. That dwelling is not just about the everyday activities which we do, the practical things we do with our hands. It's also about how we make some kind of more, more spiritual connection. The title of the lectures is is connected to uh, a very famous essay by Heidegger, okay, by a German philosopher from the 1950s. I changed the first, uh, the first word, called drawing, okay, instead of building. But that's for two reasons. First of all, is this connection that Heidegger makes between dwelling and the practical everyday life that one has in a home and the more spiritual side of it. But also, Heidegger's method explains his ideas through looking at the etymology of certain words, looking at the, the origins of certain words. So, out of these three words, thinking, drawing, and dwelling, just a, a couple of thoughts. First of all, to draw in English. To draw, as we all know, means to sketch marks. Certain differences, but still. But it also means, when we say to draw out, it has this idea of extracting. The idea of taking something out. So when you draw, you're taking ideas out of your thoughts, okay? out of your head. But when we come to the word dwell, this is, this is very complicated, the origins of this word. In English, it's a very strange word. We have a dwelling, which is roughly a house or a home. It's slightly different than this one. We have the verb to dwell, which seems to translate best as to remain or to linger, to stay still. But then we also have other, other ways of using the word dwell on. This means to pause, to stay, but to, in terms of one's thoughts. One stops and thinks. Okay, so it's got this connection back to thinking. Now when we think of the word think, it's not just about cerebral reflection. I've read in uh, a quote from Richard Sennett, a book called The Craftsman, some years ago. Where his, his thesis is that actually, when we make something, skilled craftsman is actually having, using a different kind of intelligence. It's kind of manual intelligence, but it's still thought. Now, all these things together form the body of this of this talk. This, this talk. So, I now uh, present a few a few questions. Okay, I don't have any clear answers to any of these things. They're just thoughts, which I think are are very relevant to contemporary design. It's not conducive. Okay? There are many others. Simply, these are 
the relevant question. First of all, when we think about home, what are we, what are we actually talking about? What are the essential components of a home? If we look back to a very primitive idea of a dwelling, this is a, a house on a hut, a primitive hut in Menorca. Central stone column, with stone walls, and stone slabs for a roof. So incredibly small proportions. But this is a place where presumably once upon a time, around 1000 BC, a family lived, or part of a family lived part of the land. That was an example of an individual way in which humans used to dwell in, in good conditions, by the way. Here we have a Celtic settlement, a thousand years later, around the time of Christ and the Romans, up in Galicia, two Celtic settlements, where you used to have a similar series of individual huts, but they're grouped together. Here, as far as we know, but we don't know very much about how people lived in this. You can see where the fireplace is, you can see where the entrance is, you can see various other remains. But it seems likely that a family group would have occupied three or four or five of these huts. But that would have changed over time. Different families, different, <coughs> different combinations. Collective dwellings. But then we look at traditional dwellings from other cultures now, from this moment. We go off to Dwarfka, for example. We see actually quite a similar arrangement of a round hut with a, a thatched roof, with a roof with reeds on the top, allowing light and any rain that may be in the center. Now these are, uh, the point I'm, I'm making is that the conditions which we consider necessary for a home vary. They vary over time, they vary depending on the society we live in, and they vary depending on the culture. When we look at the architecture of the modern era, we think, for example, look at Wizard. And it's towards the new architecture of the book in 1923. Here, he's looking at precedents as how we can organize housing. And one of his precedents is looking at a medieval monastery, which he, he drew in Italy at M, and how the organization of monks can give us some clues as to how people can live together. And at the same time, he's looking at other precedents of his era, of his time such as transatlantic steam lines, effectively very high-tech ships for taking very large numbers of people in effective luxury to different parts of the world. On the other hand, when we look at what's happening nowadays in many parts of the world, this is just an example from China this year, but it's a very common occurrence that all ideas of historical precedents, how people used to dwell in the past, are being eradicated completely. We're taking no ideas, no useful clues from those opportunities. And in China, they eradicate, they knock down all the traditional houses, and they build skyscrapers. Far too close to go. On the other hand, it doesn't have to be like this. If we look at uh, the example of Santa Catarina Market, by Marais and Tagliabue, here in Barcelona. We've, on the left, we have some of the very narrow streets leading up to the market, very narrow, very tall, very, very, very dense part of town. But you see the combination with the open central public space, the drawing top left, which is the market square, right in the heart of the market. This becomes a semi-private, semi-public area which allows a breathing space, if you like, for the social housing which is incorporated into the project. So you have very narrow spaces outside, but that's compensated by the very generous public spaces in the middle of the project. If we then look on the right, over here, Carre Moncada, okay, towards Picasso. This one is the Picasso Museum. This is a Gothic palace. But you have a similar arrangement. You have very narrow streets, very tight, very dark, effectively. But it's balanced by the really quite generous, semi-public, semi-private in those days, courtyard of the Gothic Palace by the Exchange Act. So, an example of, of dwellings, of contemporary dwellings, using ideas of but Extending that idea just then of semi-public, semi-private spaces, there's, there's this distinction that we have when we say dwelling, between what is inside a dwelling and what is outside a dwelling. Here in a cartoon by Stuart Steinberg from 
in the middle 60s, we have this idea. This is, this is the representation, the characterization of architecture. Yeah. And this is the wilderness. You have nature outside, you have chaos outside, and you have order, this Cartesian geometry, yeah, which is what architects are supposed to do. And then there's this balance with these two things between what we consider private, what is inside our home, which is our control, and what we can share with other people. Now, in the 70s, there were certain other ideas. Maybe that's not the way it should be. Maybe the idea of creating boundaries around your home actually causes more problems than it solves. Social problems, or problems of many kinds. So, Super Studio from Italy, they came up with certain theories, certain concepts, as to how we can actually eradicate those boundaries together. So this is a collage explaining some idea of an almost infinite grid which can be laid out across the planet uh, with certain means of climatic control. It would allow people to dwell anywhere. Anywhere they like. They don't need a fixed home anymore. They can move. Everywhere is the same thing. So, this leaves us with a question. What should a boundary of a dwelling be? It's obviously, we can think of front doors, we can think of walls of the glass. But should a boundary to a dwelling, a place in which we dwell, should it be more opaque or should it be more permeable? Which is better? This is a question which depends on every project. But it's a, I think it's something which is very significant to be thinking about as we start to design. So when we think of boundaries themselves, what kind of boundaries do we need in order to make that sense of a place in which we can remain in which we can dwell. But this is a very obvious example of a castle, which is very clear. So this is a monastery down in Italy, southern Italy, uh, a convent, which is fortified. The idea of the wall around the outside connects with the cliffs, the natural boundary, makes a visual boundary, makes uh, a boundary of access. It's to stop people getting in. It's to stop the nuns getting out. But, when we look at another kind of fortified group of buildings, okay, this is an example from Olegandros, which is an island in Greece, in the Aegean. The idea of the town the top situated on top of the cliffs is that there are many pirate attacks, and the way that they repulse the pirates was, well, instead of building a whopping great castle, like in the last example, they actually organized the whole central street central houses of the town to be an area almost like a labyrinth with very, very few doors, entry points. So the idea is that the control access to the center because any invaders, any pirates get lost. They don't know the way in. So it's the same result. It's a fortified, protected space for the, the people who live there. But it's achieving that with totally different means. This is a camouflage castle. The walls disappear but the idea of limited access is still there. So we then take these ideas and we think about a, a domestic project. So we look at Can Liz, for example. Can Liz is a house, 1971, in Mallorca, built by Jorn Butson. Now, I haven't shown the plan, but we look at the two drawings at the bottom. These are sections, design sketches drawn by Utzon himself. Okay. The top one, this drawing here, is through the living room. You have a patio at the back, you have a porch area here, you have the main living room with a bench, you have very large window niches, you have a cliff top, and this drops away 20 meters, 18 meters down to the sea, which extends to the centre. This section here is going through the same part of the cliff, but uh, 10 meters further to the south, and it goes through a dining courtyard, patio, an external space. My drawings at the top, this is the living room, and this is the dining pattern. You see, they both look out to the same horizon. The orientation is the same, approximately. But the impression you get from each one of these spaces is completely opposite. When you sit in the dining terrace, it's open. You have the sun coming in, you have the view, but you also have the sound of the sea crashing. You have the wind blowing. You're exposed to the elements. It's a very dramatic one. Meanwhile, when you're sitting on this sofa here, you look at, this is glazed. The glazing is fixed. The sound can't come in. 
we have the view, but the noise you listen to is effectively the view from this person here is looking at this is that the noise is this. This line is drawn here. The noise and the ventilation which actually comes from a wooded area behind. So suddenly you have a totally different kind of limit. Okay? You have there's no visual limit. The visual access to the sea is the same. But the acoustic limit is different, and that totally changes the effect of the space. So thinking about limits, one thing is how do we make limits as architects? Do we separate out the sense of acoustic, smell, sight? But also, where do we put those limits? Where should those limits be? Uh, most of us would think of the standard, the classic idea of a dwelling. Drawings by Alvar Alto from the 1950s for all of vernacular architecture here in Spain. Okay. Small farms, farms stay, spaces for animals. Because a, a dwelling is it's more than just a place with a pig, so it has to have the other functions which that kind of family, that kind of society requires in that location. But on the other hand, perhaps the boundaries of a dwelling don't actually need to be the four walls around your own home. Luca Ruzzi's diagram for the Unité d'Aventation, Real Radios, Here we have the dwelling, the classic dwelling of one family unit. But this is then shared, it shares various spaces, service spaces, recreational spaces, schools, and shops, has all these things, which are shared between many people who dwell in the same building. So in fact, the boundaries of the dwelling in this case are not just the four square walls of the home, but they become the boundaries of the property. The boundary of a multi-family building. This is a larger scale. Again, it's more of a territorial scale. We in fact dwell in a city or in a territory or in a large area of landscape. We are the idea of an angel looking down on a piece of urban planning. It's Mario Malagueda. On the other hand, we can reduce the scale. The scale doesn't have to be territory, it can be the scale of our own physical bodies. This is the idea of Diogenes, a Greek philosopher from around 400, 400 BC. He chose to live his life by example. He got rid of everything he didn't need, and he chose to go and live in a barrack. Now, I think there are two interesting things here. One is because the scale of the actual is living requirements. We don't need it. But the other thing is that he chose to live in a barrel and not in a, a small cave or something like that. He chose to live in a barrel because he could move it. And Alexander the Great came to see him and there were various stories about it. But one of the things, Alexander the Great asked him why he chose to live in a barrel. He said because he can move it. When it rains, he can roll his barrel south. When it's too hot, he can roll his barrel north. Now in that, there's an interesting idea. Which is that when we think of the limits with which we surround our dwellings, should those limits be fixed? Or should they to some degree be able to move? Should they be mobile? Now we don't have to talk about uh, archigram, the idea of cities, vast building on legs which can move, okay, which can uh, effectively walk. I think this is a very contemporary issue. Because when we think of society as we have it today, it's a very it's an increasingly mobile society that we live in. So, Buildings can be prefabricated. They can be built in sections in order to be removed. You can defabricate. You can then refabricate buildings somewhere else. You think of the idea of nomadic peoples throughout history. They lived in tents. They've taken their architecture, their dwellings with them. If we go back to the Iliad, Homer's Iliad, when the army arrives at Troy, they come in their boats. But then, in order to, to, to make their encampments, they take their boats, they pull them up the beach, and they turn the boat upside down. The boat upside down then becomes the dwelling, the dwelling of the soldiers. Okay? So when we talk about nave, okay, the name, in English it doesn't work so well, in Spanish, you can see the relationship between a boat 
and the building is very clear. Now, I think it's very interesting because it means you have a mode of transport at one moment, all you have to do is turn the thing upside down and it becomes a dwelling. So there's, there's some a relationship there which I think is worth, worth reflecting, especially for us today. Now, just some observations. These are more my, my suggestions that when we start to think about designing a project of dwellings or many dwellings or one dwelling, three thoughts. When we dwell, we dwell in a place. So any connection that we can establish between where the building is okay, and ourselves is good. That's what we should strive for. Secondly, that any dwelling that we make needs to be flexible, needs to be adaptable. And the, more, the less specific it is to our current needs, the longer the chances that that building will have a long and fruitful uh, and flexible life. When we talk about sustainability, things to talk about solar panels and active systems or even passive systems. But another very simple thing is to keep buildings open. Long life this. And thirdly, the idea with the hyper-connectivity that we have in our, our lives today, always connected to internets of one form or another. In my opinion, that's a good thing, but it must be counteracted by a greater connection with the real world. We can sit and look at our telephones, our computers, our internet, we can sit in a basement with the lights off if we choose. But I think we'll do it more effectively if we can be in a space where we have contact with the time, with the weather, with the sun passing. And in conclusion, coming back to the idea of drawings and representation, of all these drawings we've looked at here, some of them serve to explain ideas of dwelling, but others are very much working concepts. The architects have made their drawings in order to focus their own ideas, to think and to design. So that when we think about designing dwellings of the future, well, perhaps drawings are the place to start. Well, that's not